Nobody has to change. Nobody has to adhere. Don't, don't bring up the law. That's bad. The Bible never says that. In the New Testament, even Paul said, the law is not bad. We need the law so that things function properly. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so the modern church got into this idea that grace, grace, grace did away with any parameters of expectation of behavior. We thought that grace replaced any kind of structure and that every man or woman could just do whatever charismatically, float through the clouds, and if it felt right, then it must be of God, and just do and just understand this person is this and that. And, and the church became a melting pot of freaks, fruit loops, and cornflakes. And it became a place of confusion, chaos, and ultimately it lost its influence because it doesn't have the supporting power of Jesus Christ and his word. If we love his word, we love his law. His word is law. Every word, every jot and tittle, every word that God speaks sets a parameter of expectation and guide rails, guard rails to stay within and not because he's just looking for a fault to find something wrong and, and to legislate some sort of execution to some poor soul who stumbled out across the highway and fell into the ditch. That's not the point. The point of God's word word is, is to streamline the parameters of his expectation, make it very real and bring it as revelation from his word to the human heart so that, that his people who are genuinely received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, washed in his blood, receive a new nature, and then as a result began the heartbeat of impulse and activity resulting from that as a source of their life, not of themselves any longer. They are dead, but they are alive in Christ. And the source is coming from Jesus man manifested by the Holy Spirit within the individual. And they behave and act accordingly to the word of God. And the reason for that is that he wants to literally replicate the kingdom of God. He wants to replicate heaven here on earth through his individual vessels known as the church of Jesus Christ. And it's not because we are just living in a sense of, well, I'm adhering to rules. No, I'm living from a source and I live within that guidelines, not because I'm forced to, it's because I want to. Why? I see the value of obedience. Are you hearing me? I see the value of obedience. And hence, when we come to the title today, believe me when I say this, the word is enough. Amen. The word of God is enough. I want us all to say that again, just all of us together. Can you, if you really believe this, the word is enough. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can't wait to get into this this morning, but, but I want to revisit one other thing. And I, and I, and I even make apology at one point if I'm being redundant and I am, but I, I really believe from last Sunday it probably kind of spawned within my heart as a result of revisiting that memory in my life many years ago. It did, Jim. I, I really believe from that revisiting of that memory of a horrific experience in my life at that moment and going through a very, very severe time, probably the most severe time in my life that I've ever faced. And as a result, those words the Holy Spirit spoke to me that day forever changed my life. It literally set the foundation, produced a foundation, and literally became the very rocket within my soul that launched me literally into living a life in Jesus Christ. His words was that powerful that day on a Sunday afternoon because I'll, I, 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 I don't forget it. I don't want to forget it. And it has become in 
imprinted and ingrained within the fabric of my heart and actually has seeped into the woven wool of my, my soul as well. And in those moments, and you think, well, all of us go through these things, and we do. Every person in here, you could point to a very tragic experience in your lives, and some of you may point to more than one tragic, revolutionary experience in your life to where if it wasn't for God, you may not even be in these pews today. And that's not overdoing it. That's not embellishing it. It's very true. I can also say the very same thing as you also. I think we all can. But in that moment, in that afternoon, if I can be redundant just for a little bit to launch into this, in that moment of weeping, of a heart, and, and you may have went through this as well at some point or points in your life as well. And so echoing what God has done for you also. And in that weeping and tears, nothing fake, there was nobody around, it was not a show, it was not a public display for self-pity. There was nobody around, it was the only one in the house, it was the only one in the living room, there was no furniture barely, there was a card table in a, in a dining room, that was it, the couch was gone, I think the TV was on the floor, if I remember right. I had a bed. I did have that, but I lost everything, everything. I lost it all, everything and relationships and, and physical things. I, I was down to nothing. And in that hour, I was in this church. I was not the pastor of this church at that moment. Uh, I was asked to speak that night, if I remember correctly, by the previous. And as I'm lying there on the floor, face down, uh, weeping, crying, my heart was exploding in hurt and in pain. I was at that moment susceptible to extreme offense that would lead me to a life of bitterness and unforgiveness. I was at that intersection in my life. I'm, I, 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 couldn't have, I couldn't have told you that at the time. I'm reflecting and telling you that looking back, that's where I was, that if I allow this to get absorbed in my heart and I start looking at people as, the, as, as demons and devils and all that they have done to me at that moment to destroy my life, uh, it, it easily could have led to a life of bitterness and misery turning to other substances to try to dull the pain for the rest of my life. I'd have, ne I'd have not continued in this church. I would not have been born again. I'd have went back out in that world and lived probably seven, ten times worse than I was before I got saved. Now, in that moment of, of distress, weeping, crying, soaking the carpet, it, it wasn't five minutes. My memory is correct. It was at least an hour. I, I, I became to a point of such distress. Uh, it was like I just wasn't going to function. Uh, again, losing everything. I mean, 100% of it all. And when I was lying there, I'll never forget when the Spirit of God, I, I'm so thankful for this because the, the Bible is not about quotable verbiage. It's not about words that are fancy and sound nice, but do nothing. The Bible is a real active organism. And when you believe it, it comes alive in you and for you and even outside of you. It will change things. The Word of God is not just a textbook, and again, of just quotable phrases and psychological babble that titillates the hearing for a few minutes and onward we go without a change. But I tell you, when that, when the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart that day, and he didn't, he wasn't there to, to pet my head and say, oh, it's all right, it'll be better. He didn't say that. I mean, as strong as you can say it, not nasty, not hateful, but in love, but it was a strong. When he said those two words, get up. I mean, I, I heard it, Jim. I mean, it was like you were standing there in the living room with me. I mean, I was I lying there. And I mean, just like a, a, like a jolt of lightning hit that room and hit my soul and my heart, my hearing. When I heard those two words, get up. And I mean, it, it hit me hard. I mean, I, I'm there just flooded out. I mean, just broken. I was literally broken in two inside. And when, at that moment when he said, get up. That it wasn't just another person talking. It wasn't just somebody passing by, hollering some sort of two words. But it was the third person of the Godhead. 
And when he speaks, something happens within your soul and it reacts to it. And, and at that moment, it was just like everything, it was like time stopped. When he said, get up, I mean, I jolted like somebody electrocuted me with those paddles on my chest. And I immediately came to attention. When he said, get up, and I thought I knew who it was. I was young, Christian. I, you know, I wasn't, I, I didn't have a lot of knowledge. I, I just, I, I knew how I was raised. I had that knowledge. I, I was reading. I was praying. I was seeking God. And, and, and I, I knew enough. And, and I did get up. Those words raised me up. <laughs> it wasn't a Lazarus dead body, but I tell you, I was a dead heart at that moment, and, and it, it raised me up on my feet. I got up, and I'll never forget, and, and not embellishing the story whatsoever, and I, I'm looking at that wall. I just stand up, tears stained, just broken, and, and just standing. I'm looking at a wall, and over here's the guy, and I'll never get, a, again, being redundant, but that, that hand, it was like an unseen, gentle hand touched the side of my face, and I, I just gently moved forward, and I saw my Bible li lying there on that card table. And that's when he said the words, there. Amen. I was looking straight at that Bible. He said, there is where you'll find all you'll ever need. And Tammy he was talking about this, and I'll never forget it. And I walked over there, and I, I obeyed. I knew it was him. The devil's not going to tell you, go read the Bible. <laughs> the devil's not even going to tell you to get up. You know what he's going to say? Stay down. It's worse than you thought. It's not going to get better. Your life is going to end. You're torn to shreds. Give up, give in, and go down to Jack's. I didn't go to Jack's. I went to another, but anyway. <clears throat> And, and, and go do this and go do that. That's, that's the devil. The devil wants to perpetuate misery. Amen. Yes. But I'm going to tell you something in those moments. I have to, I, I'm going to admit something else you know, in a good way. In that moment when the Holy Spirit filled that room, I didn't hear another voice. Amen. Yes. I tell you, when God's word fills the room, there isn't room for anything else. Amen. Yes. I didn't hear another voice. I didn't hear a question mark. <laughs> I, I didn't hear the devil whisper. <laughs> My flesh, knit, nothing said a word. All I heard was him. And that's when I walked over the card table. I obeyed. I walked over to it. And I was asked to minister here that night. And I opened my mind. That was Psalm 91. And that's when I came. And I preached that that night. I, to this day, I felt like it was the most anointed message I ever preached in my life. Why? I mean, I was preaching for my life. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I had to get out of this now. Not, not in the situation. I'm talking about I had to come back alive. I had to make sure. I couldn't go down and live like that and just end it all in that situation. I want you to realize all God was saying to me was this is what's on your wall right now. All God, all the Holy Spirit was saying was, you may be in the worst position you've ever been in your life, but I'm here to tell you the word of God is enough. Are you with me? Now, I want you to look at this and look at one, uh, Psalms 119, but I want you to turn there in your Bibles. I only have one verse on the wall, and that's correct, but I want you to turn there in your Bibles for a reason. <laughs> See, that day in my life and, and in your life as well, when you face these things, there came a collision. You came to an intersection and had a collision between your logic and faith. Logic looks and assesses only what it can see as a situation, persons, people, what they've done. It only looks logically in human ingenuity and fleshly response on how to fix something, how to endure it, how to get through it. Faith, on the other hand, takes me and you out of the equation and puts God into the equation. And now it's not, no, it's not any longer how I can fix it or you can fix it. It's how God can fix it. That's the difference between the flesh and the spirit.
The flesh will always look to oneself or other human beings to fix and solve the situation. The spirit man does not do that. The spiritual eye does not look to man for anything. It looks to Christ. So therefore, if this person would say that, I'd feel better. In the spirit, God, just give me a word and I'll be better. Amen? See the difference? Now, the word of God. Look at this in verse what did I tell you? 60 or 165. 165. Now, 165, he says, let's all read it. How much peace will you have? How, how much? This, notice, everything in God is not barely getting by. I'll just give you just a little bit. Everything he gives is extravagant. In other words, you won't have a little bit of peace. You have more than you need. Always remember that. Great peace. How much peace? Would you agree? That's a lot. And coming from God, it's really a lot. <laughs> He's the source of our peace. So great peace have they. But now listen, nothing is automatic. You have to sow before you reap. If you want to receive, you first have to give. Am I right? If I love the, these testimonies set me off here. <laughs> I love it. If you, if you want forgiveness, you give forgiveness, don't you? Yes. You sow forgiveness and then you'll reap it. Yes. Amen. It's the way with Jesus. There's, there's nothing. What Jesus wanted, he wanted us as a family. Amen. So he sowed it first. Then he reaps us. Amen. Now, when you look at this, great peace have they which what? Here's the prerequisite. Here is the condition. Every, everything in God, every blessing in God has a condition. The condition has to be met first before you receive the reward. What is the reward? Great peace. How is it given to whom? They which love. Love what? Love it. Love it. Now wait. Love the law. Not love to quote it. Loving the law according to Jesus. If you love me, keep, obey, do what my commandments say. Is that right? So what David is saying here, and he is the author of this longest psalm in, in your Bible, longest chapter, great peace of they which love thy law, meaning this, love the law, those who actually obey it. And if you obey the law, great peace, more than enough, will take and enrapture your life and soul and spirit. Now also take notice of one other thing. This is called a spiritual peace within the inside of the person. Now notice you can live in a chaotic environment and you have great peace. But great, when you have great peace, it will start to affect <laughs> any environment you're in, we should be influencing it. fighting going on, chaos going on. But if you have great peace, you don't have the human component of peace where there's just lack of fighting, lack of this, and that's now that's peace. We have peace on a higher level. We have peace because we have been absolved of our sins with God and we're in right relationship. And as a result, joy fills our soul and we have peace. Our soul is at rest. That is fed by the divine power of God and the Holy Spirit. When you walk into an environment of chaos, that doesn't remain in you. It is going to come out of you. <laughs> Great peace should affect other people in our lives. We shouldn't be stirring up trouble. We should be calming things. We shouldn't be provoking something. We shouldn't be instigating it. We should be peacemakers. Why? Because that's who we are. We are at peace. Are you, are you hearing this? This is why, this is why it can happen either way, but this is why people who are, you know, 
One condition, tormented by evil spirits, get around you and start feeling, feeling what's living in you. You take David, Saul was tormented by demonic power. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't get any relief until he would call David. David, play the harp. What was David doing? He is worshiping God and what's in him comes into the room. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. If you activate the word in a room, all devils in the room have to cease their operation. When you fill a room with God, there's no place for the devil. Why? Greater is he. They can be there, but they're not going to operate. Why? Because he's greater than they are. If it's the other way around, you wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> you can have 10 devils in a room, but if you have one Holy Spirit, they are rendered inoperable. Amen. Mm. I talk about the individual uh, that, that comes around. Again, just using my own experience, but you have them as well. You know, who is tormented, much I think like Saul, but in a different way. And seeing experience in his life is, is it, he, he says it. It's, it's not a thought. Says it. I, I tell you, I have voices in my head. I, I'm tormented. And, and I'm just, it, it's, it's bad. And I know it is. And he, and, and we talk tormented, but he says, uh, but if I can, if I get around you, not, it's not me. What it is, it's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. He said, if I get around you, he said, them voices stop. Amen. There are times he will tell his wife, I'm going, I'm going to our city down here. And I'm going to spend a day or two with him. Why? Why is that? Because those demonic power stop. Why? Because there is a great peace in someone near him. Amen. Amen. You hearing me? Why? Why? Now, should there be a liberation? Absolutely. But the person has to accept liberty, has to accept freedom has to accept the power of Jesus Christ for themselves. Now, being around you or being around me can bring temporary peace, but they won't have sustainable peace until they make it personal themselves. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You, you see, great peace have they that love the word. They act on the word. They do the word. And oh, see, this gets us every time, isn't it? Read the rest of it. I know we'll choke when we say it, but let's try it. And, and what? H how much again? But out of a hundred, probably three things. H how much? Nothing. Is that a hundred percent? A hundred percent of everything that happens will not offend them. What's offend? Create an opportunity to trip them into failure. He is saying here, God is saying through David to us that he can bring an insurance policy of not tripping and falling if we love the word. Loving it is not just quoting, oh, I can say it. I've heard, I hear people quote the word and live opposite of it. But they feel good saying it because it, it's a temporary ease of the conscience. We don't want a temporary fix. We need sustainability within our soul. We need a lasting, an everlasting, sustainable production of the Holy Spirit and Word within us to keep us going every day. I don't want to live like a yo-yo. I don't want to be up one day and down the next. I, I don't want to be just all over the map emotionally. <laughs> I, I don't want to be just one day you talk to me and I'm like this. The next day you talk to me and you never know what you're getting. Jesus wants us to be stable people. So stable that others in the world start depending on you. Now that's not to create dependency. It is to create an opportunity of influence to bring them into the same situation and uh, way of life as you live. Yes, 
It's called uh, as a testimony. It's 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 cre- it's putting salt. You know, you hear the old saying. You know, you you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But if you salt the oats, he will. <laughs> That's what, we're, that's what we're doing. He said, see, so it's great. And so what are we doing? Uh, every word we speak, salted. What are we doing? We're creating thirst. Ah, uh, we need what you need. We need what you got. We want to drink from the same fountain that you're drinking from. Amen? Now, <laughs> so now, uh, now, I don't have it in the wall. But would you just, if it's in your, if you have your Bible, I just, I thought this was good in these other verses, and then we'll go back on track. He says in 166, Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation. Now, notice what he says next, and done thy commandments. I've done them. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. Did you see those words? I love them, not just love, I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies for all my ways are before thee. Mm. Man, he just goes on. I mean, this, this whole psalm is about the, the law and the word of God and the love for it. You, we could read and read and read. This world... This world, let's get back on track now with this verse up here, verse 165. This world has an emotional problem. I'll say it again. This world has an emotional problem. How I know as well, just on everyday life, if you don't believe people don't have an emotional problem, ride for 30 minutes on the beltway. There's emotionalism on display, Jill. I mean, what kills me is, is what matters to people. One car ahead, and it's worth me cracking the tin on my, my fiberglass because I need in front of that car you're going to have to wait. Well, I will not wait. Matter of fact, I'll wreck to achieve it. I mean, you, you get in that beltway times, I look at people are not happy. Nobody's happy. I mean, if you do see somebody happy, they might have been token on something. <laughs> in there singing with a convertible down. You know, he said, well, something wrong with that guy. You, you know, but uh, just, just, you know, just, just like this here, just looking around. I'm, what are they doing? They're, they're just, they are so offense prone, they will be offended within minutes. You cut me off as if they've never cut anybody off. But when they cut somebody off, they have an excuse. Well, I couldn't help it. That guy did. <laughs> it's the, the world. Everybody, it's just, there's an emotional problem. You, you have, <laughs> I mean, wars start because somebody couldn't control their emotions. You have people getting shot every day in America, every day, because somebody couldn't control their emotions. I mean, you, I've seen videos, people shooting each, shooting each other at the red light. And I get to thinking to myself, over what? Well, somebody pulled in front of me. That guy rode my rear end. I can't take it. I, I Believe me, I... There's times I feel it. <laughs> There's times I think about it. <laughs> Rarely I act on it. <laughs> but, you, but you know, there's, I mean, y- you feel it. But whether we do it or not, it's a different story. Okay? Now, 
The word of God, watch this verse, watch this verse. You know what this does? Why is people like that? Why are they so emotionally frayed and gone off? The word of God solves all emotional problems. All of them. How? Look at this. Solves all emotional problems because emotional wounds occur through offenses. When I am offended, my emotions are like a wound that keeps, whether you put salt on it or keep rubbing it open. And that thing festers in the emotions to where the emotions will now build a shield to shield and protect the wound that is in the spirit. This is why, this is why you'll deal with people who lash out all the time. You don't even, you just say a little thing. You've got to walk on eggshells. Be careful now. Will you say the least little thing? Wah! They're like a cat that touched a socket. I mean, their hair stood out, calls out. All you said was just something very small. And it's like, Wah! You said, what, what is wrong with that person? And there is something wrong. What is wrong with that person is simply, they have been offended in their life. And they've never allowed forgiveness to heal it. Now their emotions strike out all the time to protect. Why, why won't they let forgiveness, anybody let forgiveness heal that spot? It's called pride. It's pride. And any time pride is existing in the life, pain will be felt. Because it's alive. But the word of God, if I do the word, live the word, read the word and live it, and it's absorbed within my heart and in my soul, I love it. That's proof because I'm doing it. Then God says, no matter what happens to you, it will not affect you for the rest of your life. You have the power to overcome it. When that pain hits, you forgive, and what happens? You cut the attachment and its umbilical cord and its ability to feed contaminants to your soul, ruining your spiritual life. The moment something happens, you forgive, you absolve it, it's gone, it has no more effect in the life, and you remain emotionally stable. Why? Because peace has been maintained. Remember something, your soul is your garden. It's up to me to make sure it is tended to. It is up to me to keep the weeds out. It's also up to me to keep intruders out. It's the foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little, little things that spoil that vine. Remember that. Don't, Paul said, don't give place to the devil. Don't give him an inch. Once he starts with an inch, it's like a cancer cell. It begins to explode and becomes metastasized and gets into every spiritual part of life. Now, <clears throat> this Bible, this word, all of us want success. What is success? It's spiritual success, but our success will always require change. This Bible, in, when it's adhered to and obeyed, will produce change. It will change your life. In other words, if it produces change, it means, and the inference is made, as a person, I need to change. I have also found, we were saying this earlier, I have also found also that I haven't quite arrived yet. And there was your chance to say amen. In other words, I and you are still growing. And we will grow, we will grow till the day we leave the planet. Amen? 
<laughs> and, and you might be looking at me right now and say, well, Pastor, do you, do you ever have to say to the Lord, forgive me? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. What, well, why do I ask for, because I goofed. Why? Because I stopped acting on the word. And I allowed something to fester that shouldn't have been festering in my soul. Amen. Whose fault is it? Mine, not God's. Matter of fact, it's not even the devil's. It's mine. This is my garden. What grows here is a result of me. Nobody else. Amen? Now, my, my success requires change. That is why I need the Word of God. The Bible, this book is a book about change. It even provides hope for change. It imparts the keys to change, how to change. I mean, this book is just incredible. I'll, I'll say it again. It's a book about change. It lays it out about change. It will even provide hope that you can change. It will also, it will also impart the very tools and keys to change. It provides, now listen, it will even validate it within these pages. It will even prove and gives and provides proof people can change. And listen, we're not done yet. It provides examples of those who have succeeded in changing. <laughs> can you say amen to that? When you read the Bible, you see people, can I, can I bring them out? Look at Peter. He changed. Amen. He was a scoundrel. <laughs> Amen? I'm going to give you some others here in a minute, but Peter was, I mean, he was something else. I, I mean, but change. E even, look at James and John. James and John, when they, you know, even in the middle of the ministry, and they're called the Jesus, just call down fire. Let's incinerate everybody down there, the dirty scoundrels. And Jesus basically looks at them and says, you need to change. Amen. What do you mean we need to change? You're ignorant. You don't know what spirit we are of. We're not here to kill. We're here to save. Amen. What happened after that? They changed. <laughs> How do you know they changed? Read the writings of John. That boy got it. He, was, he, is, he is known as the disciple or the apostle of love. Well, he wasn't always like that. Thank God you are, you're still not the same as you used to be. Amen. Well, I was born perfect. Well, there, right there is a sign you need to change. <laughs> now, <clears throat> do you know something else that can change? This, the Bible provides this. Do you know what else can change? Your circumstances can change. Amen. This Bible is full of circumstances changing. Not because of waiting and just timing it out and this and that, but the Word of God being involved and God being involved, circumstances changed. Now, the story, the story, this, the story of Joseph is a remarkable collection of miracles Someone's anger, emotional instability, someone's anger put him in the pit. But his faith put him in the palace. I want you to see that. Do, do we suffer sometimes from collateral damage? Yes. Yes. I, I take you all the way back. Just uh, this popped in my head. 9-11, for example. Were there, there possibly was a Christian or so who died out of those almost 3,000 people. That's, that's collateral damage. Some, some nut jobs got in planes and ran into towers. You know, that's not normal. You all do agree with that, right? It's something weird. Okay, emotion, there's something wrong up here. But as a result, collateral damage, people suffered as a result, families suffered. 
But in this situation, you may land in circumstances that people have created through their anger and emotional instability, and they create a rough patch in your life. You didn't create it, they did. But I want to tell you something, though someone's anger and emotional instability and their hurts and things they haven't got over, and it's now starting to try to affect your life circumstantially, but I want you to remember, though they may have put something or put you into something you didn't desire to be in, but your faith will lead you out. Their, their anger and instability doesn't have the power to keep you there forever. Your faith will open the doors to get out. Does this make sense? Somebody's anger put Joseph in the pit. Somebody's lie, lie, put him in prison. Collateral damage here. But the Bible says God never left Joseph. God was always with him. And Joseph kept acting on the word regardless of what somebody else was doing. In other words, don't capitulate and play the same game they play. Stay above it. I always like uh, my lions, you know. I, I love that one saying, you know, every, you know, a, a big old male lion, 500 pound. I mean, he's walking down the, you know, some little old ankle biter come, <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> you know, comes ripping up behind him. They don't always turn around just to, you don't have to fight every time there's an invitation. Just walk on. Well, it's not worth it. I saw a video, it's a real video. There was a, there was a male lion and, and two females. They were in a, in a field. I don't know what, why, why this happened or how it happened, but some dog and uh, it wasn't very big. And out in the middle of a, a plane, like, and, they, and these, you know, I guess safari, whatever the case, I don't know where this dog, because this dog was not like a, um, a hyena or wasn't a, uh, those other wild, it, it actually looked like a domesticated dog. And this dog come running out to this big old male line and two females and yipping around, even grabbed the male's vein or, or mane, and just, he, he yipped up on it and grabbed on it, and the, and the male lion just knocked him off, and it was the funniest thing if they could talk. You saw these three lions looking like this at this dog, yipping like a nut, and they never attacked it. They, I, I don't know if they were so perplexed. Uh, I, I guess they thought the dog was on drugs. I don't know. So you came up in here. <laughs> what in the world are you? And it wasn't worth enough to kill because it wasn't much meat. You know? so they just, they just kind of looked. You ever see that video? It became viral there for a while. But, but in, in the real essence of things in our own lives, you don't have to pay attention to that little stuff. You don't got time for it. Amen? Now, <clears throat> what's the... So Joseph changed his situation by his faith, moved him into the palace. Now, on the other hand, the Word of God shows examples of those who are unwilling to change. There's a lot of people unwilling to change. Does anybody know anybody like, don't raise your hand, because well, we might figure it out. All right. Now, the Word of God shows examples of those unwilling to change. You know, Jezebel would not change. She just wouldn't change. And God did what? When someone is unwilling to change, what did God do? He removed her, threw her out of the window. Do you remember that? You know what? Ahab, King Ahab, her old weak husband, <laughs> Ahab refused to change. And what happened? He died in his sins. You remember Prophet Elijah confronted him. Korah, remember Korah back in the most time, back in, in so forth. Korah refused to change and his entire family suffered the consequences because he, he wouldn't change. Okay. The cry of Jesus to Israel during his time was change. I want you to change. And if you change, the blessings of God will come to you. And this is what he said in 2337, Matthew, towards the end of the ministry. And he's weeping. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. 
You refuse to change. As a result of refusing to change, Israel has suffered for thousands of years as a result of unwillingness to change. And the only time they will ever change is during the tribulation. And that's how brutal and hard a heart can get. It will take seven years of tribulation until finally Israel will accept that Jesus Christ is the only true Messiah. And he's coming back as their Savior. And in, in just a day or so, they, the, the, it'll be opened up and they will repent of all of their hardness and sins and Israel as a nation will be saved in one day. They'll all come to Jesus. Amen. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And you'll witness that. You'll witness that yourselves as coming back with Jesus Christ. Now, only the obedient are guaranteed rewards. God has never responded to needs only. The world is filled with millions of people who are needy, hopeless, desperate for help. God has never responded to just pain. Millions live in daily pain, financial, physical, mental, and they yet they never experience change. This is where the world misses it. This is where news pundits miss it when they start blaming God for tragedies and everything else. God doesn't respond to that. What does he respond to? He responds to obedience. Obedience alone attracts God to facilitate a miracle in the life or the situation. Amen. When people say that in news, punditry, and all of that, boy, where's God in all of this? Uh, he's where he's always been. He's on the outside because no one is obeying. Amen. <laughs> Amen? How can God let that person and this suffering and this and nation suffering? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. God only responds to obedience. It's because leadership in many countries are not obeying the laws of God. Therefore, the repercussions is people suffer. Why? They're unwilling to change. Money is more important than faith in God. Money is more important than seeing people's lives become better because I want myself to be enriched. We have to be careful. America's going the same way. We, we're, we're getting to a place now in America that, that all that we live for is some sort of monetary gain, and that's all that matters, and that's the only barometric that we use for success. But however, success in God is that I'm living in obedience. My life is, has more than enough peace, and I, I'm fulfilling the pur purposes of God within my life. There is success in God. Winning souls is the highest purpose in life. Amen. Amen? Not self-enrichment. Now, the, your knowledge of the Word of God, now this is, this is not going to set very well. We're down to just a few minutes. Look at James 2, 21 through 23. Your knowledge, my knowledge of the Word of God does not guarantee my or your success. I want that to marinate right there. Because what I just said is, is not false. I'm going to prove it. Your knowledge, meaning mine as well, our, our knowledge of the Word of God does not guarantee success. Amen. I'll say it one more time. Our knowledge of the Word of God does not guarantee success. Then what does? Was not Abraham our father justified by what? By what? When he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Now, what, what is the importance? Because God said, God commanded, not suggested, commanded. Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Well, good. Just go ahead and do it. No, you have a part to play. You want the reward? Yes. The reward comes on the heels of obedience. What's my obedience? Take your son and offer him up on Mount Moriah. Oh, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, coupled with it, and by, and by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, he was called the friend of God. Go back to this again, look at verse 22. Seest how 
thou how faith wrought coupled with his works in, in tandem, and by works was faith made perfect or complete. What makes faith complete? Not just knowing it, but doing it. Now faith is complete. Okay? Now, <clears throat> your obedience to the word determines your success. Your obedience to the word of God will determine everything positive that God has for you. Ignorance in Hosea 4, 6. I'm going to hurry along. In Hosea 4, you know these scriptures very well, but I, I want to revisit them. He said, my people are destroyed for what? For what? Do you know who the devil destroys? The ignorant. People are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Collateral damage of disobedience is in force there. Okay? Ignorance is deadly. That's why we don't want to be ignorant of the Word of God. It's deadly. Satan can only take advantage of the ignorant. Let, let's, let's move quickly on, and I'll, I'll go to another verse here in just a moment. The price of being with God, the price of His presence, the price of His presence in your life, the price of His presence in the church, in our corporate setting, is time. The purpose of his presence is not just to sit with us and just whatever the case or be a friend or a bud. The purpose of God's presence in our life is change. Simple as that. Two plus two equals that. That's what it is. His purpose of presence in our life is change. He is to produce that change in our life. That's why he's here. To produce more of him in us, which requires change. The product of his presence, the product of his presence, the fruit of his presence will be what? Holiness. Holiness. Holiness is the nature of God. It acts within the law. Amen. The goal of Satan is ignorance, and it is his only weapon against the church. Only. His only weapon is ignorance. If he can find ignorance, he finds a foothold of destruction. That's why we need the Bible. Let me ask you a question. You, you think about this. The old timers, I'm going back to grandparents, great grandparents especially. Do you know the one thing they did every week without fail? They read the Word of God. Amen. And they did it with little education. Yeah. And you would find God would teach them His Word. Now think about this. Back in the day, the great-grandparents and great-grandmamas and all of that, one thing they cherished was the Word of God. Now, you say, well, why didn't they? You say, well, I tell you what, they, they weren't wealthy people. No, most of them weren't but I'll t on the outside. But I'll tell you one thing they had. You would see miracles flow like rivers. Amen. Yes. Amen. <laughs> I mean, miracles, healings, deliverances. I had great grandparents. Their vehicle got filled up with gas, an old whatever car that thing was. I don't know, model. I don't know what the thing was, and filled up with gas. On E, puttered out, and God sent two angels. <laughs> appeared out of nowhere, filled it, and disappeared the same way. You say, well, boy, that don't happen today. It can happen today. Those people lived in the glory. They loved the Word so much. You know where they were going that day? They weren't going to Walmart. You know where they were going? They were going to church. And they were so hungry for church, they didn't have enough gas, but they said, Lord, we're obeying the Word. We're going to church. We don't have the money. We don't. They didn't. And, and they weren't lazy people. <laughs> Coming out of the Depression, all of those kinds of things. It was, and, and we're going to church. And they acted on faith. They obeyed the Word of God. And God says, if you obey the Word, I'll provide. Hallelujah. 
And they, they believe we're not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves because what we're going to hear and what we're going to experience in the house of God is so important we can't miss it, even if our gas tank's empty. And they took off, and, and halfway they was going up a mountain. I forget, Mom. You probably remember more of the story than I do. They was going up a hill, I think, or something, and the thing ran out of gas. And, and then, well, we're on our way to church. And that's God rewarded their faithfulness. They were lovers of the word. <laughs> this is, a, you, we say today, well, I tell you what, what about that, uh, was that Covey of Quail hit Savage in the porch when they were uh, old ministers, the old, old guys, and didn't have anything, and they had all those kids. How many kids they have, Mom? Three or four kids, and, they're, and they, they had no food, and yet when they prayed, when they prayed, when they prayed, uh, there was no food, but a Covey of Quail hit the front porch and all of them died. They went out and grabbed them up, cleaned them up, and cooked, had food. You say, well, boy, I wish that would happen today. I want to tell you something. God will provide if you love the Word of God. That means doing the Word of God. What were they doing? What were they doing? Acting in faith. You know, what that, you know what that father did? Everybody bow your head. What are you going to do? We're going to act by faith, not by logic. Our logic said there's no food, none in the cupboards, and we're going to starve to death. But our faith says, if you believe God, he is Jehovah Jireh. He will not leave us dead. He will not leave us sacrificing along the road. We will rise up. And, he, and they prayed in faith and said, God, we thank you for the food in Jesus' name. And God says, whoa, somebody is believing they're acting, then I'm obligated to fulfill the promise. What's your promise, Lord? I promise to provide for them. And you know what he did? Even the quail had more sense than most people. <laughs> and they obey more than people. And God said, quail, I'm sorry, but it's your day out. <laughs> And the quail hit, ran right into the, and, and, and they went out and, 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 and PETA was not found anywhere. God's not very woke. <laughs> Do you know what? Satan doesn't fear. Now, this is going to come as a shock. I got to get a caboose on it. You know here we have 15 cabooses and all. Satan doesn't fear your sinning because God will forgive. Satan doesn't fear your depression. God will enter and drive it away. Satan does not fear your poverty because God will provide. I'll tell you what Satan fears. He fears your discovery of the word of God and he's helpless against your knowledge of it. The moment you act on what you have read, he can't take it away. You hear what I'm saying? The only birds that plucked it in the soils was where the seed laid on top of the ground and never got in the soil. If all I hear is here and never drops in the soil, the devil will quickly just keep moving seed out, 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 out. But the moment I taste it, act on it, gets in, he can't do anything about it. He just lost. That's why when a sinner, a sinner can sit in church for years. I saw it happen in this church. Young lady came to this church years and years and years and would not get saved. She knew the Bible frontwards and backwards. I knew her parents knew it frontwards and backwards. There wasn't anything you were going to tell her about the word of God. She didn't know. She sat here and listened to the word of God for years. As a matter of fact, about every service, we had three at the time, almost every service she was here, young lady. And, 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 but yet the devil just kept taking the seed, tempting the seed, and she kept living in sin, living in sin, parties, all of that kind of, just lived it, lived it. But she was faithful coming to the house of God, which is interesting dynamic. And, but the, the seed had no effect. But one night sitting back here, I'll never forget it. One night sitting in the power of God hit this house and she crushed all the way out of her mind into her soul. Her heart went into a puddle of liquid and God touched down to the core of her soul. She went Went down and, and in her seat. I remember bowing. I heard wailing in that in that seats there. It was her mother was wailing over knowing she, she didn't hear everything, but 
she knew what God was doing. And in that moment, God moved from the head to the heart, and that girl changed from that moment forward. And it's, it's not about just sitting in the atmosphere. i got to let it inside of me. Satan kept stealing it until she tasted it. You can change my opinion about a cheeseburger as long as I don't eat it. <laughs> but the moment I eat it, you can't tell me how it tastes. I've done experienced it. I know you don't like hearing it, but I love cheeseburgers. Big, thick, gre greasy. Dwayne, I gre they got to have grease in them. <clears throat> All right, sorry. It's, the Baptists are eating our cheeseburgers right now. <laughs> All right, I just got to close. I'm not even done. I'm not, well, we. All right, let me just, let me close on this now. What caboose are we on? Fourth, humans judge the love of others by word. God, I want to get to this. Humans judge the love of others by word spoken. I've heard it. You've heard it countless times. My father never told me he loved me. I, now, I just put this, don't, I, this is not, all right, I'm just going to say it. My husband rarely tells me he loves me. My, my childhood was lacking in affection. I didn't mean to write this in a personal way, Jill. I did. Those speaking these words admitted that their father paid the bills, provided a home, and was good to them. But they were upset because he never spoke his love. God has a different viewpoint. And he says in Matthew 15, 8, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The point of all of that is, and, and I've said this about my mother. No, 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 wait. It's good. It's good. I, I've said this about, you know, I don't know if it was in that Erickson Viking bloodline or what, but she, she, she's not like a lot of parents I see today, just, you know, sloppy over their kids and, you know, just, oh, yeah. she wouldn't like that. Um, she didn't tell us, you know, she wouldn't say, oh, Ruby, I love you. If she did, you thought she was sick. There's something wrong. <clears throat> but I've said this. I've said this. But I never questioned her love for me. Why? Huh? I knew it because she cooked every night. She kept the house the way it was. My clothes was, and the, the atmosphere was always, always like a real home. And when you walked in there, it was like safety. You had, your clothes was washed, food was done, house, it was just mom. She, she just, she put everything into that. She mothered us boys. Now you didn't hear, I love you every five minutes. Now, what you would hear, Dwayne, when I played football on the other side, we called it Cal Patty Stadium. You can figure why we called it that. Cal Patty Stadium. Us boys, there were about 20 of us, 18, 20 of us from the neighborhood all gathered. But at 4 o'clock, I'd hear the most shrill pitched voice you ever heard in your life crossing that pond valley and up on that mountain or up on that big hill. And I'd hear this, Rabbi, Supper. And I don't care how fast that football game was going, Dwayne, everything come to a stop. Everybody looked at me and said, Reuben, we'll wait on you. You need to go. <laughs> and another boy or two would follow with me, the Joes, and they'd follow with, they were uninvited, but what do you do? And uh, we would go and, and eat. But what is that? See, that was love. That's love, isn't it, Jill? So what would you rather have? I'd rather have love. See, that's real love. You have a lot of parents today, they'll tell their children every five minutes, oh, I love you, I love you, and let them get away with all kinds of stuff, and they're setting them up for failure. That's not real love. Amen. Yes. Amen. 
See, what I appreciate now, I didn't at the time, I thought I had terrible parents at the time. Oh, I thought, oh my, how can they treat me like this? But I look back and realize they were setting up for success. Amen. Dad, I want to do this. You're not doing it. Well, I'm crushed. Well, get over it. If I, would have, if I went into my mother and said that, I, I can imagine kids that go to my mother and say, that, you know, if I would walked up to mom and said, mom, uh, can, can I, I want to go do this. You're not doing it. Mother, you have to take in my feelings. We need to sit down here at the table and let's discuss this. You know, my mother would have said, get out. Go find something to do. And when you walked out the door, you'd hear a click. She'd lock us out. That's a fact. She would lock us out. I'd come to the door wanting back in, said, I need to use the bathroom. She said, there's no line at the outhouse. Now you're starting to wonder, did she love us? Well, you know. I'll just shut up. I, I just leave. I think we... Uh, Obedience impresses God. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Quickly and lastly, but when you enter the presence of God, your weaknesses will die. When the wisdom of God enters your heart, your decisions will change. When the word of God enters your heart, your faith in God will increase. When this gets inside, your faith increases. When the word of God is sown into your mind, your mouth will begin to speak the words of God. This is how important this is. Amen. It's more than just a black book, tan book, red book, whatever you have as a cover. It's what's on the inside will affect and change your life for the best. Amen. How many needs the word of God? How many can testify to that? How many can tell, boy, the word has changed my life. Amen. Continue doing it. Whatever you're facing today, apply the word. Apply the word and watch it move and watch it change in your life and change the circumstances. Somebody's lie might have you where you are right now. Your faith, though, will lead you out. Though it may have landed you in a pit, your faith will put you in the palace. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for it. Thank you, Lord, for your mighty grace. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for your tremendous, tremendous affection towards us. Thank you for 